So hello and welcome to building single page applications the right way. As Brian said, my name is Justin Meyer. I'm the CEO of Batovi and for the last eight years, all I've been doing is building big JavaScript applications um, for in every kind of situation you can imagine. And uh, this talk, there was about 30 in that slide. Uh, this talk is about, is about the top techniques or the most unique techniques we use to build high performance, maintainable, and a little bit fun JavaScript applications. <laughs> I've structured this talk into 10 five-minute lightning talks, so I'm going to have to go extremely fast. It will get a little technical if you, uh, if you don't understand some of the code or the slides. Um, just try to listen to the sound of my voice, because it'll be explaining in principle what I'm doing. Just ignore what you see on the screen. Uh, <laughs> so uh, with that in mind, um, <clears throat> oh wait, one first thing I got to talk about. I created a place my order application that is a simple app that encompasses all of the techniques. Thank you, whoever just turned up the mic. <clears throat> you can find it at Bitovi slash place my order, and I'm going to be using it for all of the examples and techniques I talk about today. So I'm just going to go real quick and show what's in the app so that when we talk about these techniques, you can see how it applies. Uh, very simple app, has a home page. When you uh, server side rendered, when you um, choose a restaurant, it's going to make a push state that allows you to pick a state and pick a city and get information about a restaurant and place an order. So I'll do go to Chicago and 312, of course. And I'll place my order. And once you place an order, you can um, see an order history where you can walk through um, each order through different states. So it's preparing, out for delivery, delivered. And this is a real-time application. If someone else was on it making changes, you would, you would see those changes. So this app, if you do check it out on GitHub, has everything that I'm talking about. So you can go back and kind of learn these things in detail. So despite how technical I said this talk was going to be, the first thing that I think we do unique at Bitovi is make use of checklists. Um, Checklists have a long history of making everything better, um, from helping pilots fly to helping doctors save lives. We have a checklist project that you can see here, Bitovi GitHub IO checklist, that is a really simple checklist that has just a bunch of um, management, UX, and development questions. Things like, are there social events are there, uh, what, are, what is the vision for the project and the roadmap? Um, do you do user experience testing? Do you, um, that's another good one. Do you do source uh, code reviews? I think checklists have worked really well for us because, um, let me get back to presenter view. Because I think everybody knows what needs to be done on a project. It's just hard sometimes prioritizing it. We all know we should be doing code reviews. We all know we should be writing tests. Um, sometimes we don't do it mostly because you know, we have other priorities, other things we're thinking about. A checklist makes it easy to make sure everybody's doing the right thing at all times. Because we've done so many projects, uh, over probably like 34 projects now, uh, we have some interesting data, too, regarding what um, impacts, what strongest uh, what correlates strongest with success? So these are the highest management-related things that correlate to success. Obviously, the, the number one thing that correlates to success is can you release a project within six months? Right? That, that's an obvious one. <laughs> things like yearly trainings and companies that actually have social events for their team outside of work, uh, those also strongly correlate to success. The design things that correlate strongly to success, doing user testing, getting design documentation. Now here's the really interesting thing. These are the highest development related factors that correlate to success. And they're far, uh, they correlate to success far less than most of the management 
and most of the UX uh, questions. So this having checklists, at least for us as a company, has um, guided us and kind of humbled us because we realize that management and user experience decisions often matter much more than uh, technology decisions, but as technologists, we're constantly getting hung up in framework battles and things like that, where if you really care about the success of your project, you might look into some of the more of the management user experience um, items that your team should be doing. So that's the only non-technical one. So let's get into the technical stuff. So I found this awesome quote on um, gu uh, JavaScript guru, Chrome team engineer, Adi Asmani's website. And it says, the secret to building large apps is to never build large applications. Break your applications into small pieces, then assemble those testable bite-sized pieces into your big application. Uh, it's extremely well said. That, that's, that's me. That's a joke, but I think it's too small so you guys can't read it. Realize how hilarious I am. Um, <laughs> so one of our earliest, most important development strategies um, was the introduction of the Modlet workflow which treats every module as its own application. What this means in practice is that instead of organizing your projects like this, where every module is grouped by type, you have a folder for all your JavaScript files, a folder for all your CSS files, we always group everything, every module in its own folder. Every module has its own folder, has its own tests, its own documentation, um, any other files like CSS or templates that are associated with it go in that folder. And there's two other things that we include. We always include a test page that runs just that module's tests. And for visual widgets, um, visual modules, we include a demo page that shows off just that, that uh, module's functionality. So the benefits to this are it's easier to identify when someone's missing tests, right? Because you can look in the folder and say, hey, there's no test file. Also, I think developers are much more likely to update a test when, the, uh, when they're working in a module and the test is staring them in the face because it's in the same folder. And of course, leading, making tests and making demo page leads to good API design. And finally, I think the biggest one is that it, you can develop in isolation. You can work on your module and its tests just within one folder, completely ignoring the rest of the application. So I have a quick example of this in my... So I have my uh, app order page, which you can see here, I can, I can uh, edit this. I can, this is the just the order uh, widget and I can also run its tests. Pretty, pretty basic, and this looks like in the code, here's my order, and I have my demo page that loads, imports my, um, my order uh, component and uses it in the page, and that's as simple as it is to get a demo page and a test page, I'm just loading the order test tests. Highly encourage people to use this pattern. Okay. Number three. So we've taken, lately we've taken the idea of every module as its own application to the furthest extreme that I know by putting a lot of our modules in their own projects and then publishing them to NPM and then importing them into our big project. So, for example, the Place My Order app has a tabs widget. Um, instead of you know, hiding it away inside the Place My Orders code, we created a, a standalone, uh, put, it, put bit tabs in its own repository with its own tests. And to import it into our, our project, it's as simple as just npm installing bit tabs, which will add it to the node modules folder. And then to import it into that order, um, that order uh, module, all I do is import bit tabs. It is a custom element. 
And I'm using ES6 syntax if people don't recognize that. And because it's a custom element, all I have to do is add bit tabs to my page. And I'm going to create a panel for the lunch menu. And I'll eventually create a panel for the uh, dinner menu as well. And I, to make it, I just loop through each menu lunch item, um, add a checkbox for if the, uh, if, the, if the lunch menu item is selected, and add its name and price. And then I'll just copy this code to make the dinner menu. So hopefully you can see how one side of the putting things in its own repository and pulling it from NPM can be made extremely easy, right? And any other project that we have, if we want bit tabs, we can just NPM install it and use it as quickly as I just showed. Now, if you're using CommonJS and Browserify, you're like, this is old hat. I've seen this before. But if you're using CommonJS and Browserify, you only you're limiting who can use your code and what code you can use. Because one of the biggest problems with client-side JavaScript development is the fragmentation of all the different module loading syntaxes. Right? There's the upcoming ES, uh, ES6 syntax, which is the import bit tabs. There is CommonJS and Browserify. There's the I forgot to start my timer. There's the uh, AMD, and people still stuck in 2005 are using script tags and, um, and link tags to load their, load, their, load their JavaScript code. So we use a project to build our applications called Steel.js, and that allows us to, here's bit tabs code. No matter what bit tabs is loading, if it's CSS, templates, other uh, common JS modules or AMD modules, we can export this project so that it can be used by anybody who's using AMD CommonJS ES6. So this will run a script. We, I run my grunt build script, and you'll see it'll create a dist folder with all of these exports. So bit tabs can be used by anybody. Um, and you'll even see that the tabs uh, less file was transpiled to CSS, and we inserted the uh, CSS uh, plugin for Require.js. So if you're using AMD, you can actually require this tabs and the styles it depends on. So my hope for all of this is, obviously, we use it for reuse a lot. We can create widgets, use them in all other different projects really easily. Also, when you pull something out and you publish it to NPM, it adds that very useful bit of metadata um, for the semantic version of your package. Because when everything's tucked away in an application and someone makes a, a changes a module that your code might depend on, you don't know if they've added a new feature or they've broken the API or they've fixed a bug. When you publish something to NPM, people are putting that version number and typically it gives you a good idea. Also, it's made release management easier for us. We'll actually put our pages in different rep repositories for a big site. And then if we want to assemble the full site, we just point at specific versions of different pages. And if one page version is breaking, well, we just roll back to an older version and redeploy the site, which is really nice. And finally, my hope is for projects like Steel.js that it can Im improve client-side open source. There's a big problem in JavaScript open source community right now, compared to if you look at nodes where there's few projects that depend on other projects. It's very hard to build like a rich hierarchy of advanced functionality in JavaScript because of all the different module loading syntaxes. But if we can make it so that you can use any module syntax you want and export it to every other module syntax, well then my hope is that we can start getting this rich topology of open source JavaScript projects. So this is, this, what I just showed enables that. Number four. Custom HTML composition. Uh, custom elements are everywhere. Um, I'm going to talk about why they're awesome, and I'm going to talk about what I think we do special with custom elements. So first, why it's awesome. Some of you in this room might be old enough to remember the old days when you wanted to add functionality to a site. You would have to put add some HTML to your page, and then you'd have to, in your JavaScript, find that element, and invoke some behavior on it. That's all gone now, because every modern framework lets you define custom elements. 
And a custom element, when it's inserted into the page, you know, instantiates itself. So this is what it looks like in React. This is what it looks like in Angular. This is what it looks like in CanJS, which is what I'm using for this presentation. When we design um, our applications, or sorry, when we design our custom elements, we design them with this guy in mind. This is Betovi's UX director, right? He doesn't know JavaScript, but he knows HTML and CSS. We have two goals. We want to make our templates so that he can understand them, but we also want to make those custom elements powerful enough so that he can express behaviors without bothering the engineers. Right, so you can change and add a lot of richness to the page without uh, himself, just by understanding these elements and rearranging them. So we have, one, we have two strategies for that. The first one is a tag team of two different types of custom elements. The first are custom elements that can actually load data into the page, into the template. And the second are custom elements that are composable themselves. Here's a, for example, I have a bit graph component where as I add different series, um, it'll add you know, new lines on the graph given some data. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a quick example of this in action. Let me refresh the page. Okay, so here I have a page that's just showing a single restaurant's um, order history, the amount spent on per each order. And this looks like this. Uh, where is it? This looks like this. I used my order model to find all orders for Cheese Curd City. That's the name of a restaurant. Sounds like it's from Wisconsin. Um, and then I, I, I'm putting that data into the template, and then I'm using that data for this bit series. Now let's say the designer wants to add another, uh, do a side-by-side compar -side comparison between Cheese Curd City and some other uh, restaurant, Poutine Palace. Um, I'm not gonna type it out, instead I'm gonna steal the code. They can add another order model. So this is gonna load Poutine Palace's data into the page, and then all they would have to do is add another bit series for that data. And then save the page, refresh it, and they have created their own new behavior, right? They've loaded data themselves, they've added a new line to the graph. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing that we do is, and you might have noticed it, we actually allow people to declare dependencies in the template themselves. So here, that can import from UI bitgraph bitgraph, that is actually doing the importing of that module into the page. This is great for our designers, so if they wanted to add bit tabs to the page, well, they just import bit tabs can import bit tabs and start using it in the page. Again, they don't have to bother us as the engineers. So the final thing that we do isn't for our designer, it's for us. And I really love the upcoming um, uh, web components spec in that you can kind of define lightweight components in, cost, kind of in, in the page directly. This is defining a, a Hello World component that you can see its template and its style and its behavior. Uh, we have our own version of this where you can define a can component and give it its tag, its styles as less, um, and build things this way. So I, I really like this for, because what happens if in a big application is you tend to start actually getting a lot of little widgets and you don't want to have like five different files a less file, a template, and a view model for something that can be quite small. Okay, the, the next one is, number five, is unit testable view models. This is all about how we um, design and test and build our view models. And building view models is really like, all, a lot of times, the most work that you're doing in a big JavaScript application. So, 
I'm going to use as an example the restaurants ordering, or the, sorry, when you pick your restaurants page. And this page loads the states. Then you can pick a state. Then you can, it loads your cities. You can pick a city. Then you see your list of restaurants. And then if you change your state, it, re it removes the restaurants and reloads new cities for that state, but then you have to pick, an, it clears the city, um, the city option, right? This, what they chose for their city. So first thing I always do is, of course, look at the functionality, and then I identify the values that represent the state, right? So the way that I always do this is I have some kind of JavaScript object that I keep track of all of the stateful properties of this, uh, of this um, user, um, of, this, of the, like, you, the design or the behavior, whatever you want to call it. So first thing you can see is we're loading states. So I'm going to have states as a promise that's going to be an array of all the state data. It's going to resolve to an array with all the state data. I'm going to say that the state that they pick, I'm going to save that state as, the, um, uh, as a string for which state they picked. Cities is going to be a promise of all the cities that are loading. And the city that they select is going to be the name of the city. And then finally, there's going to be restaurants, which is going to be a promise with all of the restaurants. Right? This is the first thing I do when I'm coming to a page to design it, is I figure out these properties and the behavior for these properties. The second thing I do is I write a test for the view model. I'm a big fan of test-driven development. So, this is all going to be, I'm going to go through these slides really quick, so if you don't understand it, uh, again, listen to the words of my voice, pay no attention to the screen. So to test it, I set up my testing infrastructure, load the modules that I need. Then I create my fake data for my test, because my, my view model is going to reach out to the model to ask for you know, restaurants and states and cities. Then I use this fixture utility to hijack all AJAX requests, intercept them, and instead use the fake data that I'm providing. So instead of when, a, when we try to do an AJAX request to API states, and instead we'll use our fake data that I'm providing. And then finally, I'll create an instance of my view model that I'm going to create, restaurant list view model. And then I'll just verify all the different steps. I'm going to make sure that the, um, I'm going to make sure that my states property is a promise and I'm getting back all of my fake states data. Then I'm going to set the state to a uh, state property to a state, and then verify that I get my cities changes, and I get a list of cities um, from the same same cities that match my fake data. And then I'm going to set the city, and I'm just going to keep walking through this. It's going to change the restaurants, and I'm going to get the right restaurant data back. And then finally, I'm going to set the state to a different state and verify that the city uh, value is removed and that I'm getting a list of all cities, a, a list of new cities. So that's how I write a test, just testing the behavior of the view model and those properties. So finally, I'm going to write the view model. And this is, again, this is with CanJS. This is what it looks like. It becomes really easy. You just define the behavior for your different properties. The state's initial value is all states loaded from the server. The state behavior is, is, is side effectual. Whenever the state is set, I want to remove whatever city was set. Because if you're changing the set, the state, well, then whatever city you've picked should not, uh, should not count. So remove it. Then I'm going to define the behavior of the cities. Cities is dependent on the state, so if there is a state, I'm going to return all cities for that state, and otherwise I'm going to return null. Some of you might be asking, that's, that's not valid JavaScript syntax. It is. I'm using ES6 syntax. That makes an object with state colon state. Um, next, uh, and finally, I'm just going to define the behavior of, uh, of the restaurants, which is just like Cities, if there's a city in a state, return all restaurants uh, for that city-state combination. OK. And then the final thing is you just write your template. 
So here, the, the template is just, I'm just showing the part of the template for the state uh, dropdown. And you can see I'm doing things like disabling the select until it, while states is pending. While it's pending, I'm showing loading as the only option. And then if the person hasn't picked a state, I'm gonna say choose a state, and I'm gonna go through the list of states and list them, right? So I, I think the benefits for this model are really that if you're figuring out the stateful properties of your view model and then testing them, then the implementation becomes easier to do, and then finally your templates become super straightforward. Right? I, I do everything in that order. Okay, the next one is two-way routing. Um, I'm gonna explain the difference between two-way routing and one-way routing, give an, uh, an example use case, and the, talk about the benefits of two-way routing. So everybody's familiar with one-way routing, especially if you come from the server-side world. One-way routing, you take in URLs, and you get back, typically on the server, it'll call some method somewhere, but really one-way routing means you get some URL and you get some data back out from it. It goes through the routing rules and gets back out some data. So if you had restaurants Cheese City, it goes through these routing rules, you'll get restaurants Cheese City as data. Similarly, if you had restaurants Cheese City Loader, goes through, uh, goes through th these routes, you're gonna get this object back. Two-way routing allows you to go from the data back through the routes to get your eventual URL. And I'll show why this is really nice in a second. Just give one more example. If I had page restaurants, state Illinois, city Chicago, went through these routes, I'll get a URL that looks like that. So the benefit, the real benefit, which I'm gonna to get to for two-way routing is that you can change, if you're using two-way routing, you can write your application so that you can change the routes at any time and you only have to change the routes and the rest of your application just keeps working. But to do that, you have to change your code slightly. So I'm gonna show the changes in code. So a lot of times people write their apps that look like this. If the route matches some pattern, do this. Otherwise, if the route matches some other pattern, do this. To use two-way routing, the first thing you need to do is change your code to instead use stateful properties that are on the route. So instead, I'm gonna check if the route's page property is home, then I'm gonna render the home custom element. Otherwise, if it's restaurants, I'm going to render the restaurant list element. So that's one change you need to make, is go from this to this. The next change is instead of um, writing your URLs like this, where you're kind of writing them manually yourself in the template, instead you use a template, uh, you use a helper that is gonna go through the re reverse routing algorithm. And this will take page restaurants slug equals slug and convert it to the same href we saw before. But the magic of two-way routing is that if you go from uh, this, these routes, to these routes, well, everything still works, because it's all just checking properties, and all your URLs are created through the reverse routing algorithm. So the benefits, it allows you to write your URLs one way, uh, or sorry, manage all your URLs in one space, and have the rest of your application just work no matter what your URLs look like. Okay. The next one is number seven, and this is the one I'm probably personally most excited about talking about. Um, I think we've solved in a really good way how to do real-time connections and um, a lot of performance optimizations in the, uh, in the client. Um, real-time and performance optimizations can be really tricky to get right sometimes. Let's say I had two widgets that I wanted to put in the page and write independently. And these are each gonna show, one's gonna show completed to-dos, the other's gonna show incomplete to-dos. Just some questions to prompt you guys thinking. How do we make, these two can be combined to make a single request for all to-dos. How would we do that? Um, when a server-side update happens and a new to-do is created, how do we manage which list to put it in? How do we manage when an update happens to move it from one uh, list to another list? And then how could we save this, their data in local storage so 
um, we don't have to make the same request again. The answer to all of these problems is surprisingly simple. It's set logic. Yes, sets as in Venn diagrams. And you might be wondering why sets. The reason is because whenever you request data from a page, you're actually providing a representation, or you're requesting data from the server, you're providing a representation of the set that you want, uh, of the data that you want to load. Right, if I wanted all to-dos for user five that are completed true, uh, I might do something like this. And set A represents you know, a set. Now if you treat that like a set, and you can use that to compare it to other sets. So I have set B here. Set B is um, user five's completed to-do, not completed to-dos who are critical. Set B represents a subset of set A. So I know if I've already loaded set A, I don't have to load set B's data. So we created a low-level library that allows us to do set comparisons with objects that look like these. It also lets you create custom set algebra so that you can um, compare uh, other things that are not like just straight properties. So if I wanted ranges or enumerable, enumerable properties or Boolean type properties, then I can do things like this, which is compare, knows that the, a, uh, a range that starts at zero and ends at 50 is a subset of a range that starts at zero and ends at 100. Now with this set logic, I'm gonna start walking through a lot of the performance optimizations that you can do. So the first one is you have two different widgets that are, one's loading completed to-dos, the other's loading incomplete to-dos. You don't want them to know about each other, but what you can have them go through is the same model layer, and that model layer can see incoming requests, wait an instant until a few might have a chance to come together, at least ones that are coming at the same time, and it can do a union of those sets and instead make a request for all data. Um, let's say I went to a page showing all completed to-dos, and that requested the, just the completed to-dos from the server, and then I went to the page showing all to-dos. Well, it's gonna request all to-dos like that, but I can do a set difference and get, and know that I just actually need to, because I've already loaded completed ones, I know I need to only load the incomplete ones. Now where the sets really kick in is real-time connections. So let's say the server pushed some data for a new to-do, complete false, ID five, uh, name to-do, do dishes, you can read. <laughs> um, now I've got, now I know I've got two different sets in the page that I'm currently showing. I'm showing the complete and the incomplete. We can do the same set logic to see that the new to-do set is a subset of the incomplete set, and then automatically insert that new data into the list and let live binding take care of just actually inserting it into the DOM with like no additional logic, right? The supermodel will take care of this, and I'll explain how in a second. <clears throat> so this Place Your Order app, Place My Order app, has using sets all of these things. Uh, automatic live updates, it does inline caching, which I'm gonna explain. It can combine requests, similar to how we already saw, and it also supports fall-through caching. And all of this stuff you get for free with this underlying set logic. I didn't have to like do anything special for this just, just to work in my application. So let's talk about how inline caching works. So this is a great technique if you're doing server-side rendering. When the user comes to the page, they're gonna request the HTML of the page, and in line in the HTML of the page, um, you're going to put the data for whatever that page is gonna then request. Uh, in this case, we put in inline cache variable. And then the page is gonna be drawn, but then JavaScript is gonna start running, and it's going to try to make a request for the new preparing, delivery, and delivered orders, the supermodel, it's gonna go through the supermodel, the supermodel's gonna see, hey, you're requesting sets of data that's already in the inline cache, I'm going to send that right back to you, and it, the page isn't gonna change because it's just getting the same data that was already used to render the page, 
Um, but the page will now be live with the data that it needed to add rich behavior. And then it'll use that data to update local storage, which is important for the next thing, which is the fall through cache. So the fall through cache um, works by when someone goes to this page with push date, it's going to make a request for all the data for the page. It's going to hit the supermodel, and the supermodel is going to say, oh, this is all, th these uh, different statuses represent all the order data. So I'm going to combine that into a single request, and I'm going to first send that request to local storage. Local storage is going to respond with that data, and it's going to be used that to satisfy all four of these requests and draw the page. But in the background, it's going to make a request to the server, get the data. Um, get the data from the server, it's gonna make one request to the server, and then use that to update the items in the page, and it'll do any insertions or removals with the new data in the new list, automagically. The, and let's talk about how real-time works. So real-time works by the server's gonna push an updated event. The supermodel knows about all the lists that are active on the page. Because when you requested the data and it gave you back a list, it knows about that list and keeps track of it. Um, so when, the, when an update happens, let's say it's changing a new item from new to preparing, it's going to see that the item no longer belongs in the new list and it now belongs in preparing, make that change to the, um, to the, to the data model, but then live binding will just take care of moving it in the right place. So. You get real-time behavior for free with sets. So I think it's just, because I like it so much, I think it's worth, worth showing real quick. So if I have my, um, place my order. So here I can just delete orders and they'll just disappear on the left, right, real-time. But I didn't have to do anything other than just call destroy on my model because that'll send the real-time connection out, or that'll send a request and the real-time connection will say, hey, something's been deleted. It will go through all the lists that the page is currently rendering and just remove the item automatically. I, I don't know. I think that's nuts that you can get real-time for free. <laughs> Hopefully you guys do too. Um, Okay, number, okay, number eight, live reload. So I'm just gonna start with a demo for this. So you guys, if you've ever used require.js, you know that sometimes in a very big application, it can take a long time to reload your page. So I'm just gonna see how long it takes to reload this page. Okay, it's taking 2.46 seconds. Um, we use a lot of live, we use live reload technology, so I can run and connect this to a, a live reload server. And now what I can do, actually I'm gonna do it in the order history page. I just want to show the speed difference in which you can develop with live reload. Um, so you can see that, and I save, and it's almost instantaneous how fast I can see the results of changes in my code. And all I have to do is save it, and it just, just works. So I'm going to talk about how this works, um, but first I'm going to say why it's awesome if it's not self-evident. So it's awesome, it's all about human attention span, really. Uh, if I have to wait two seconds for my page to reload, that's when I start thinking about Reddit or checking my emails or, or something like that. But if I can just make a change and see the page update right away within a second, then I'm staying focused on my task. Um, live reloading, how it works. Um, first, let's talk about how loading works without live reload um, with something like require.js. You go to your page, it's gonna load your main module. 
Then it's going to load your main module's dependencies. It's going to run any of the dependencies that don't have dependencies themselves. Then it's going to keep loading dependencies after dependencies until it loads the whole dependency graph. And then it's going to uh, start executing these things until it finally executes the history module, the main module, which will typically write, um, write out what the page looks like. Live reloading, what it does and why it can be so fast is that when I change history less, um, what it's going to do is it's going to delete that module's code and it's going to mark any parent modules as, um, as needing to be re-executed. It's going to just have to download that one file now and then re-execute it and just only its parent modules. Uh, and then it'll update the page with a different color like I showed. So this saves a tremendous amount of time. You're not having to re-download jQuery. You're not even having to execute jQuery. You just make a change and all the modules kind of re-execute themselves that need to, which is cool. That's all about, that's a fun one, not about performance. But this one is very much about performance. Um, we, like I feel like we've solved how to do models really well. I think we've solved how to build your application so it loads as fast as possible really well and in a very unique way. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> so I'll go really fast uh, through this. Oh, I thought I had eight minutes. My timer is off. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. <laughs> So, oh, starting at the wrong slide here. So I'm going to explain, um, I'm going to try to go through this really quick because I, I like this. I'm going to explain uh, how to optimize a site that's not progressively loaded because the same techniques apply to a site that is just kind of st different static pages. Here's my static pages and here's the modules that they load. First thing people do typically when they're building a site like this, they'll just cram everything that a page needs into one production file, um, which isn't great because then if things are used across all the different sites, every time the user switches pages, they're having to re-download more than they should have to. So the next thing people do is they'll say, oh, I'm gonna, I want to bundle that. I want to create those modules in their own bundle, and then I'm going to have all my pages open that bundle. Right? so that I can experience some benefits of caching. Now the problem with this is that it can be tri very tricky without a lot of trial and error to get the optimal arrangements of bundles, what belongs in what. what um, you know, CanJS was only used in three of these modules. Maybe I should have another bundle that these three, uh, three of the pages load, and then they all still also load the core bundle. You can make those decisions forever and never get it right. But we have an algorithm that can. So I'm going to do my best to explain how the algorithm works. If this is your dependency graph, the first thing it does is pulls out all modules that are the most shared. So jQuery and title CSS, shared by everything, combines them. These three things are used all together, so combines them. Slider is used by restaurants in order. So I'm going to combine that, and I'm just going to keep combining modules until I get um, this kind of setup, where basically in this situation, I'm going to line up the dependencies. Homepage would have to load these bundles. Restaurants would have to load these bundles. Order would have to load these bundles. And history would have to load these bundles. Now, this is a dependency graph all of its own, where you have perfect caching, but and every page only loads exactly what it needs. So home page is only loading what it needs. But the problem is restaurants here is loading five different scripts. Right? And if you have 20 pages with overlapping weird dependencies, you might have to start loading a ton of bundles. That's where the second phase of this bundling algorithm comes in. What it can do is it tries all the different combinations, which is like you know, an NP complete problem, but typically, hopefully, you don't have too many bundles. Uh, so it can try every combination and try to combine bundles, um, and then it checks how much extra code any one page is going to have to load when you combine bundles. So home page is going to have to load slider. It's having to load two kilobytes. Order is having to load 30 kilobytes because they have to load in CanJS, Carousel, and Cart. So it'll try a different, another combination, 
In this case, it's going to combine these two. So now restaurants is only loading four modules still. And in this case, the extra waste to any page is only seven kilobytes. So it'll use that combination and then keep going on to, if it has to, to combine other, other modules. This is a way that you can get perfect caching. And the only cost is you're maybe loading a few extra bytes of code that some other page is going to need that is you're likely to go to that page anyways. So that's our bundling algorithm. The, let me move back to this. The only other thing I want to say is how cool we can wire this up. Um, our, our, our main module of our application is actually a template. And because we can do um, loading from the template, this is how, what it actually looks like. We kind of have our routing rules. And we'll import, if someone navigates to the home page, we import the app home bundle. And when it's resolved, we put that element in there. And this way, we can show a spinner as the user's JavaScript code needs to load or anything like that. Finally, server-side rendering. It's all about getting rid of these kind of spinners. Um, I'm going to just talk about real quick how we do it. It's good for SEO. Um, I have four minutes, so I can. OK, it's good. For, you want server-side rendering for per perceived performance, so the app loads, and the user can see their, their page, even if JavaScript hasn't fully initialized yet. And it's great for SEO. Uh, the technique that we use is to run everything in a single context virtual DOM. Right? There's a lot of different techniques. What this means, what single context means, is a lot of times people, well, I'll talk about what it doesn't mean. A lot of times people, when a new request comes in, they will create a headless They'll, they'll create a new context in Node, and which means like it has its own set timeout. It's kind of like your own window in Node, own do, new document, and run uh, all the JavaScript code, import all the JavaScript code, and run it in there. We don't do that. We always run in a, the same context. So um, basically, that means all of our rendering, all of our code, we only have to load that once in our, our rendering. Um, we're, not, we're not creating like a new document every time to render. Um, and we're using a very, what virtual DOM means is we're using a very lightweight DOM. It really only has like append child and uh, insert before and like remove child. It's like the, the very few, and set attribute, very few methods, very lightweight, very fast. Um, and then I'll talk about when you do things this way, the cost of it is that you have everything is connected to the render life cycle, where because you aren't running in your own context, it can be tricky to know that all AJAX requests have finished. Because there might be, in the same context, other AJAX requests for a different page response going on. And you have to work that out. And I'll explain how we work it out. But first, how do we set up, how does this app set up the server-side rendering? In general, we load our main module, which is that stash module, uh, with a special plugin, because it adds node rendering to it. And then from, uh, we get a request, however, you know, in your application, you get a request and response object from Node. Um, we do that. Then we take out just the part of the path uh, of the URL, the requested URL that we care about. And we have a special render node function that just takes care of um, rendering that template um, with, the, in, with the virtual DOM. And it returns a promise that resolves to, as you can see here, the HTML of the rendered main template and any data that was associated with that page request. So if we're waiting for states to load, that'll include the states data. And we basically pass this all to a layout. Uh, we, we also can see here we loaded layout.stash, which is just a, a template that has a body tag, an HTML tag, that we can insert our main stash into. And then we render that and send the result back to the client. The only other thing that is uh, what I wanted to mention was that um, to hook up, you know, to, to prevent the rendering and to send the data along with the um, page response for the inline caching, we do this. So if we have our restaurant view model up at the top where it was getting all the states, for the component that it belongs to, we wait till it's inserted, we get that promise, and we get our topmost view model, and we say, hey, this is your 
wait for this page data, pass that it states promise, it'll get serialized and added to the cache. This is just how I feel about the different techniques for server-side rendering. Um, you could duplicate all your code, that's terrible for maintainability, but you could probably get great performance. A headless browser is actually really great if you can cache all your pages, because a headless browser will almost always certainly run your front-end code correctly, but it's not slow enough, or it's too, too slow for like dynamic, uh, like on-demand um, server-side rendering. And I think single context virtual DOM is like the perfect blend of fast enough for on-demand server-side rendering and uh, maintainable enough so you can actually write an application with it. So those are my 10 things I think everybody needs for uh, you know, a modern JavaScript application. I hope those 10 things help you turn your development up to 11. So thank you. Thank you.